Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage from the University of Southern California, Benaz Farahi. Hi, everyone. My name is Benaz Farahi. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I've trained as an architect, and currently I'm doing my PhD in media arts and practices at the University of Southern California. Um, so my practice and my work is somehow in between fashion and architecture and interaction design. So I'm looking at the ways that our body basically connects to the world around, all the way from the world of uh, variable computing and interactive fashion, all the way to the interior of the architecture space. Similar to many, many designers, for me, um, I'm interested and I'm inspired a lot by nature. Um, I think new technologies are enabling us to look at the nature in a different way. It's not about just imitating the forms from the natures, but it's about understanding the behaviors. I mean, things in the natures, they move and respond to various stimuli. I think this is incredible inspiration for us to, to, to create things that is beyond just imitation of the forms, but also behaviors from the nature. So, um, Having said that, I started my exploration of creating uh, architectural installations that trying to explore how the materials of the environment can be alive, how the materials can, can change its shapes and create the spaces that they're dynamic and reconfigurable and create something which is almost creating a reciprocal relationship with users and, and inhabitants. If you look at the history of architecture, uh, so many designers were trying to see how they can understand proportion of human body and connect that to that of uh, built environments. I think new interactive technologies are enabling us to look at this relationship in an entirely new way. So I think my interest into using new technologies and interactive technologies is the fact that how we can use our body as a means of interaction, how we can move beyond the just 2D digital interface that the computers or machine, that they just see your tip of your fingers clicking on a mouse or keyboard, but you, how you can, how you can uh, think about new modes of interaction with the built environment. So I'm going to start my, uh, to, to show two of my installation pieces. One of them is the greasing wall. It's an interactive, uh, wall that it responds to the gesture or your hands movement. So we use our hands for various communication purposes. We use our hands for one-to-one -one interaction with one another. Uh, we also use our hands for um, interacting with our everyday devices, such as our mobile phone, our, our iPads, our, our laptops. And we already developed sort of a language, such as um, swiping, tapping, dragging, zooming in, zooming out. And we all know the, what is the language is about. But what if we can actually use that sort of language to interact with the things that it's in our architectural spaces? What if we can reconfigure the shape of our environments with the movements of our hands? Similar to the way that we interact with one another, what if the, the, the environment has a character that it can understand the motion of your hand? So in this piece, I use the leap motion uh, device to basically capture the hands movements. And it was a series of uh, gestural interface that um, enabled the users to basically sculpt the form of the installation, uh, such as tapping or swiping from right to left, left to right, and various sort of um, gestural interface that enabled them to sculpt the form. So you remotely, you can point out at different nodes of the wall. Um, you can even draw cir circles. It was pretty much experimentation on how we can actually use some of these gestural interfaces to interact with our surrounding environments. I'm going to skip to next. So um, I also did an interactive ceiling installation in which I was trying to explore how this time, instead of actually um, 
using your hands movements, you can actually use entire bodily movements of your body as a mean of interaction. So in this case, I use Kinex motion capture camera. In real time, it was capturing the information about the movements of the people on their knees. And basically, this land of kinetic uh, sculptures, they were um, moving and responding based on the movements of the, uh, the, the people on their knees. So you can almost think about sort of reciprocal relationship, one shaping another. It's not about one, um, the users shaping the form of the environment, but the form of environments also can, can, can inform the next action of the, uh, action of the users. So um, I did a series of interactive installation um, as a mean of really engaging with architecture. But at the same time, I knew that I'm interested in use of 3D printing technologies and um, applying some of the logics that I have explored in the, in the scale of architecture, apply it to a human scale. So uh, I started doing a series of uh, fashion or wearable projects that basically involve with some of these ideas in a very much closer space or near environments around the human's body. And I called it uh, body architecture, which has been used in the past by a few artists um, as well. But I think really it's about how we can apply some of the ideas from architecture to rethink the architecture of our body. So the first project I want to show is a synapse. It's an interactive helmet that it responds to, the mo to, the, to, to your brain activity. Basically, the idea is um, the more you think, the helmet opens up. The less you think, the helmet closes down and creates sort of cocoon around your head. Um, this was a project that's been, has been done um, two years ago. I used the objects 3D printers um, at Pier 9. It used multi-material 3D printing, um, combined different material properties. It was a lot of back and forth process to understand how we can have maximum contraction and expansion in uh, almost uh, semi-flexible geometries. And then this diagram is showing um, the logic of how you can capture the data from the brain sensor. You get the information from the brain sensor, you compute those information, and you have different layers of information, such as attention level, meditation level, and different, different, different brain frequencies that you can capture from your brain. And then what I did, I basically mapped the attention level to the motion of the servos that is located in two sides of the helmet, so it can actually uh, move the helmets up and down. Um, the conceptual ideas behind this project was really to engage with the notion that how we can actually create something which has become an extension of human's body. The fact that we move different parts of our bodies, the fact that we have a direct control over our fingers or over uh, different parts of our body. But what if we have access to control things that are not organic? with the power of our mind. Can we claim that, that those objects become part of our body because we can control them directly? So, one of the very basic ideas for me on this project was how we can almost blur the boundaries of what is possible, what is organic, what we call organic, and what is not organic, and it's around our body. Um, the next project, which was the result of the artist in, I was an artist in residence in Pier 9 last summer. Uh, Caress of the Gaze is an interactive 3D printed piece that um, it has a camera embedded inside and that it can seize um, very basically people are looking at. And based on where people are looking at, it moves and responds in a lifelike behavior. Similar to, a, to our skin's goosebump, it creates sort of emotion uh, based on where people are looking at. So I was thinking to walk you through the process of this project because um, um, I think it's important to think about um, the process that it's um, actually happened in this project was um, pretty much, sorry, I'm trying to go back. Um, pretty much can be applied to any, the, any of the projects that I've done so far. Sorry. 
Okay, so uh, the design process of this project can be break down in three different main categories. How I generate the form, how I come up with the geometry, how I actuate it and make it dynamic, and then how I design the interaction. So for me, form or geometry is as a mean of material properties, as a, co as a way to control the material properties, how you can create the forms, how you can generate the forms that they have various material properties across the scale. Uh, so I started my journey from basically using object 3D printers, um, using multi-material um, printing in order to study a lattice sort of a structure consists of two different materials. One of them is hard, one of them is soft. Uh, so as you can see in this image, um, the joints are, cons are, are, are consist of soft material called tango and the, the white members are hard material. And then I started basically cataloging different behavior, but soon after I realized that when there is two materials, when it's soft material and hard material and meeting each other, they would very much expose to failure when they meet each other. And by looking back again into the nature, you realize that in nature things doesn't, um, the material doesn't distribute that way. The material doesn't, it never too Sharp, two different material uh, have a sharp edge. Basically, the surfaces consist of different material properties and gradients of material that is distributed along the surface. So I started changing my approach to think about how I can actually not see it as basically joints and members that they connect to, connect to one another, but I can basically see it as gradients of hardness and gradients of softness, and they translate together. At the time, I was reading a paper on the fact that um, a scale systems in fish and, and even snails, they have a pretty much hard scale systems, but in a micro level, they're located on a semi-flexible joint system that enable the entire body of the animal to bend and flex in, if, in different direction. So that was kind of interesting for me to kind of think about the formal expression that I was looking for. It was, it was, was something that it can open up, almost like apertures that they can open up and they close down uh, when, when two points get closer together. So I started a lot of process between digital to physical, how we basically can design materials that they vary their properties, documenting digitally and also producing them uh, by the end of almost every evening, producing um, one prototype and testing their behaviors with my hand to just study their, what kind of behaviors and what kind of properties they can, um, they can uh, bring about. So these are some of my um, prototypes that you can see. And, um, also, um, this is showing the digital process. Um, by a month or two months, I had the whole family of these prototypes, both physical and digital, and exploring their, their properties. Um, this is the process of 3D printing using object 3D printers. It used different material properties. The, the, the entire print took about 50 hours to finish. The next uh, iteration of my work was actuation, how I made the entire things dynamic. I used a material called shape memory alloy, uh, which is a bio, bio metal that it contracts based on temperature. And when you don't heat it up, basically, it can retreat back to its um, initial um, form. So I started basically assembling these wires into my 3D print and study their behavior. So I started also kind of cataloging different sorts of behaviors that it was happening with this material. I have to say this material is really fascinating at the same time, quite frustrating to work with because it has quite a lot of technical uh, uh, difficulties. So I was lucky enough to collaborate with um, one of my friends, Paolo, who's sit sitting here uh, at Pier 9 to basically overcome some of the engineering problem with um, the problem that it's that, that cooling time and heating time of this material is not equal and how you can actually engineer a system that it can actually uh, work quite smoothly. So we developed sort of a language for, for the actuators that it basically in a, in a process of post-assembly would assemble to the print. And this is kind of one of the very early prototypes of how the actual um, motions basically start to be prototyped. Lastly, I was looking at um, interaction design. I started playing around with the camera that um, it was able to capture different information from the people around, including age, gender, and where they are looking at. 
So I started uh, incorporating in the, cam the camera as a mean of designing an interaction uh, with our surrounding environment. This time was how we can almost create a, a, a second a skin. Our skin is almost responding to various environmental factors such as um, temperature, moisture, and sometimes even um, some, some emotions such as fear, happiness. So this time for me was how we can create an outfit that's become an extension of our a skin that it almost responds to the most subtle aspects of our social interaction, the gaze of other people around. So, um, I won't talk over this video. Uh, we produced this video at uh, Pier 9 with Charlie, a uh, digital storyteller. I just want to finish my talk by the fact that I think reality computing, um, at least for me, is not just about sensing the reality or just capturing the reality out there, but I think these technologies, and especially interactive new technologies, would enable us not only to capture the reality, but in real time develop the sort of system that it can be dynamic and it can shape change based on the information in real time. And I think that would open up a huge new potential for f possible interactive design and possible design of our built environments. Thank you very much.